up guys and welcome back to Moan Inc. If you guys are new here, then what's up? My name's Erica. Hey yo, how you doing? For today's video, I'm going to be giving you guys an episode that you have been asking for for like two years. I know that you guys have been asking for this series, you guys have been asking for this video in particular for such a long time. And finally, I am here to deliver because I do listen to you guys. I just also get tired. So I needed a bit of a break after the back end of the Aeneid series, but now we are going to be going through the Oresteia by Aeschylus. And this episode will just be a summary of the Agamemnon. So I just wanna let you guys know right now that because it's a summary, I should have said this at the start of all of my other videos because there was constantly haters in the comments, but this is just a summary, which means that we will not be doing any analysis. Now I might be saying jokes throughout this. As you guys know, I don't have any notes when I do these. So if things come out, they come out. A lot of the jokes don't work with the analysis. I feel like I have to <laughs> point that out now because so many people are like, ah, Erica. I know, I know, it's a summary. It's just lighthearted. I'm gonna be missing out a lot of detail. So yeah, just bear that in mind as we go through the play and as we go through the general action of what happens. Anywho, with that being said, before we can roll into the summary, please do not forget to hit the subscribe button and the bell icon so you know every single time I post in the future. And now that you've done that, let's get into the Agamemnon. So the Agamemnon by Aeschylus. What you guys need to know is that this play does not pick up off the back end of the Odyssey. It does not pick up off the back end of the Iliad. In fact, this play is set 10 years after the Trojan War starts, so right at the end of the war, and it is purely going into Agamemnon's return, okay? So it takes Agamemnon however long to get back from Troy itself to Mycenae. This play is set in Mycenae, and that is the time frame that we're dealing with, that he has just come home victorious from the Trojan War. So when the scene actually opens on stage, bear in mind that the audience would have known this, okay? The audience prior to going to the play would know, okay, we're dealing with this thing has been going on for 10 years, it's been horrible, Agamemnon's now about to return home, and this is, this is the scene that we get, okay? The whole play I'm describing as the scene, this is what happens. So when the play actually opens, surprisingly it doesn't open with any of the characters you would assume. It opens with a watchman on the tower in uh, Mycenae, and his job is to watch out for the signal fires which would indicate that Agamemnon is on his way home from a fallen Troy. So he's standing up there, he gives the audience a very long monologue, which doesn't give us a lot of context. And what it mostly does is tell us that he thinks his life stinks. <laughs> this guy just complains the entire monologue, basically saying, since this whole Trojan War thing has happened, I have been stationed here. My job is to look out for all of these signal fires because as soon as they start lighting, they will indicate that Troy has fallen. And then I can tell everybody to start getting ready for the King's return home. More importantly, I can start getting Clytemnestra ready for her husband's return home. Because Clytemnestra, being Agamemnon's wife, has taken over as queen of Mycenae and has ruled over the people there. All right, so that is why he's up there. He is waiting purely for the fire. He's like, sake, can this please just light already? Because I'm really over spending every single day and every single night up here. And oh my goodness, one of the signal fires lights. And he is thrilled. He is elated. Okay, this man has done nothing but complain for the last like two minutes. And finally, a signal fire lights and he goes ballistic. He's so excited, he starts yelling and he starts yelling for Clytemnestra to get ready for her husband's return, okay? He says that sacrifices now have to be made, the city has to be ready, the king is coming back, it's gonna go back to the good old days. That is not a direct quote, <laughs> just so that everyone knows. And when the watchman finishes speaking, he runs off stage and the scene changes. Okay, so as the scene changes, we get the chorus who come on. And the chorus in this play are a body of old men of Mycenae and of Argos really in general. Argos is the general area. And they come on stage and you know, everything is hustling and bustling around them. They tell us how everybody's getting ready for all of these sacrifices and all of this stuff. And even though the people of Mycenae, again, they are representing the general people. Even though the people of Mycenae are having all of this happen around them, no one knows what's actually going on. So they don't know that the signal fires have been lit and they don't know that Agamemnon is coming home. They're just wondering what the hell is all of this about? 
Now, as they're explaining this, they do explain that because they are so old, that's why they didn't go to the Trojan War. And I wanted to point that out because in my whole Iliad series, I had so many times where I was complaining that Nestor was in the Trojan War. And people in the comments being like, oh, Erica, he needs to be there. Erica, you don't get it. Okay, I do get the history. I just want everyone to, to understand that I understand the context, right? When I say jokes, they are jokes, bear that in mind. But also when it comes to Nestor, I actually have a point there because this is a group of men who are too old to go to the Trojan War, so they stayed behind in Mycenae. They didn't go, right? And then we also see a group of men in the Iliad who are hanging out with Priam on the walls of Book 3, who are too old to fight, so they're not part of the Trojan army. So why is Nestor there? It's still a question that Nestor shows up and he's like, oh, I'm so old. He's literally just there to be a counselor, but he's taking up the room of someone who could have been younger and fought, I don't know, it just, it's one of those things that plagues on my mind that I'm like, it's not that weird for Nestor to have stayed home, whatever. Not the point of this play. Anywho, back to the action. In this choral ode, the chorus do tell us about how it's been 10 years since Agamemnon has been home, and that if that's what all this fuss is about, then amazing, great, because they cannot wait for their king to be back. Everybody's super excited for Agamemnon to come back. However, they do highlight the absolute tragedy that had to happen in order for him to leave to go to Troy to do this heroic thing. Okay, so they do stress that him going to Troy and, you know, bringing Helen back to Menelaus is a great thing that he did. He led the armies. He did what a man should do, all of this. But it started with the death of his daughter, Iphigenia. And they go into this episode for us where they tell us what happened at Aulis and at the port. And when they tell us the story, it's very different to what you guys might be hearing online. It's very different to what a lot of people I think say about this episode because it is written very differently in different ancient sto stories, ancient sources even, as well. And I think that's important to highlight that actually what Aeschylus tells us through the chorus is that Agamemnon sacrificing his daughter Iphigenia was not an easy decision. But actually Agamemnon initially, when he was told by Calchas, who is his seer, that he had to sacrifice virgin blood and that virgin blood had to be his daughter, he actually didn't want to do it initially and he wasn't going to. And the only reason why he came round to saying yes is uh, because he decided that divine law is still law. And so therefore he had to listen to the gods, right? This was not just, oh, you're asking for my daughter. Okay, no problem, let's kill her. Like it was very much a difficult decision for him. And one of my favorite lines in I think all of Greek tragedy happens around this sort of story when the chorus tell us that Agamemnon had slipped his neck in the strap of fate. Okay, if you guys have the Robert Fagel's translation, that is line 217. And it goes on to explain the whole episode, but not all of it to the death of Iphigenia, but mostly just up until when she's actually on the altar. So she's been gagged by his men. They're ready to kill her. She's described as a yearling, which is sort of like a, a young animal of like one or two years old. And then the chorus end, right? So they tell us that, sort of update us, because it's obviously important for what happens in this play. And actually at some point as they're talking, Clytemnestra comes on stage. And when the chorus have finished telling the story, they turn to her and they basically just ask, what's going on? In fact, in particular, the chorus leader asks what the fires are for. And Clytemnestra turns around, she's like, well, I'm so glad you asked because the fires are indicating that Troy has fallen. So Agamemnon is coming home, yay! Now, as Agamemnon's wife, I do want to highlight that this woman is going to be acting up a storm in this play, okay? But at the moment when she's talking to the chorus, she's speaking to the general people of Mycenae. So she is not going to tell us of her terrible plan and her terrible plot, which is the plot of this play. She's acting up a storm right now. So she's acting super duper excited that Agamemnon is coming home, which I guess in a way she is, but not for the reasons that the chorus believe that she is. When the chorus leader hears this though, he doesn't necessarily believe Clytemnestra. He has kind of a tough time. So they kind of have this back and forth where Clytemnestra is trying to convince him like, no, I set up the signal fires. The chorus is like, well, how do you know that it's not a lie and blah, blah, blah. And it gets to a point where Clytemnestra basically looks at the chorus and is like, how come you assume that I'm lying? I'm your queen. I don't know why you're treating me like a child, basically. And you're asking me to prove everything that I'm saying when I'm your queen and that should be enough, which she has a point. Because Clytemnestra clearly has a good point, the chorus actually don't address that and instead they want to know all the details if Clytemnestra is telling the truth, you know, as to like when Troy fell and how all of these things happened. 
And Clytemnestra again answers all the questions. And she explains in detail how she organized the signal fires. So in case you were wondering, don't worry, Clytemnestra tells us that she says this was gonna be a better option than waiting for a herald or waiting for a messenger to come from Troy because that would have taken a very, very long time. So instead what she's done is she's organized for all of these fires to be certain distances apart. And that way, starting in Troy, when somebody saw Troy fall, they would light their fire. Right, and then a certain distance away, some other guy would see that fire light and go, oh great, and then light his fire, and so on and so forth, all the way back to Mycenae. The chorus is so impressed with what Clytemnestra is saying that it's now that they stress she is acting like a man. Okay, this is one of the first times that we hear Clytemnestra described as a man or being used, like masculine vocabulary being used to describe her. She is a very masculine female. And they say that she is described as loyal and they say that she is described as, what is the exact way that they say it? Oh, full of self-command. Okay, that is what they say. And knowing that she's on this really good high with the chorus, they finally believe her enough to stop reprimanding her and to stop, you know, demanding that she proves to them that what she's telling is the truth. She basically decides to cut her losses at this point. She turns to go back into the palace. So when Clytemnestra turns back around, the chorus leader tells the rest of the chorus that now is their time to start praising the gods. That if Agamemnon, their king, is coming back, if, you know, Troy has fallen, they should thank the gods, they should thank Zeus, because he's really the one that they know is in charge of that. He had the cosmic justice in all of that. So they start to do their prayers, but as they're doing their prayers, as the chorus is lifting up their voices, in comes a herald, and the herald comes running onto stage. I imagine that he is panting, he is tired, he is sweaty. He's been running for God knows how long, and he immediately collapses in front of the chorus, and he's just like, I'm home. Now this comes at a good time, because during the chorus's prayers, they're asking if maybe the gods have tricked them. Maybe this isn't true. Maybe they're like, okay, Clytemnestra is telling us the truth, but maybe the gods have tricked Clytemnestra, and so then Clytemnestra has to trick us. Who knows if this is true? So when the herald comes in, the chorus pretty much get the confirmation that they need, that they now know that this is 100%, because the herald starts exclaiming how Agamemnon is on his way home, he's not too far behind, and that the city should get ready for a kingly return. And the chorus are like, hell yes! The chorus engage in conversation with this herald, and let me tell you, the Herald tells us some stuff that we definitely do not need to know. He says how terrible the war was for three reasons. Okay, one of those reasons, which is actually the last thing that he lists, is that obviously the war itself brought about a lot of death on the battlefield, right? So the fighting was horrible, it was terrible, what the men had to face was ghastly, and that's what he stresses as his last point, okay? His penultimate point is disgusting. And literally every time I read it, I'm like, you could have spared us the details, but thank you. And so what he tells us there is that not only was there a problem on the battlefield, but also in the camps, the men had a lice problem. And he just gives you the details of that. And you're like, we, we didn't need to know, we did not need to know that. Like, I don't think that this Herald understands <laughs> that he has control over what he tells everybody else about how the army had to handle and instead he's like, we had a lice problem. I'm like, you could have just highlighted that, you know, there was plague in the, that's something that we could have had highlighted, not the lice thing. The lice is just like too much detail, in my opinion. And I'm like, ew. And the last thing, which is actually the first thing that he mentions in his speech, <laughs> which I'm laughing about because it is just the most ridiculous thing that he's like, and on top of all of that bullshit, the weather was <laughs> Just like, you've been at war for 10 years and you're gonna come home and complain about the weather. I get all of the points of, uh, of, you know, analysis of this part, so don't worry guys, but just on the surface level, we all have to admit that on the surface, this is quite silly. I understand that there were veterans in the audience, I understand that Aeschylus himself is probably a veteran of war and life is probably a genuine problem amongst armies. So this is something that everybody could have, you know, really understood and sort of connected with these ancient Greek heroes. But again, I think Think the point is valid. You have control over how people see you. You have control over how this story is told and you are choosing to highlight the lice and the weather. Okay. Anyways, he concludes that whole thing by basically saying that because all of that was absolutely terrible, they are thrilled to be coming home. Agamemnon's not long behind them and uh, that all of them are just very, very happy to finally be on home soil since they were convinced that they would never make it home again. In response to the Herald, the chorus leader starts basically explaining that they were just raising their voices up to Zeus and they will continue to raise their voice up to the gods in honor of the army and in honor of all of the men. 
As he's saying this, Queen Clytemnestra comes back onto stage and she goes right up to the chorus leader and she basically says, how come you needed this guy to say everything that I just told you like 20 minutes ago in order for you to believe it? Which again, she does have a valid point, okay? Because she did say all of these, you know, minus the gory details, she did say the army is coming home and only because the herald was there were the chorus finally like, okay, now we 100% believe it because we've seen a herald. And still there is a bit of them that is still kind of pulled back from reality. They're still not entirely sure even though the herald has told them. And Clytemnestra basically just lays into them and is like, a hot second ago, you were telling me that I was deranged. You were saying that women get excited over nothing. You were saying that I could just be believing a lie, that I'm gullible. And yet this man tells you everything and it's totally fine. She's pretty pissed off. And in fact, she's so pissed off, she does not really let the chorus leader get a word in. And she turns immediately to the Herald and we see Clytemnestra turn from this queen that has a plan to an Oscar fucking winning actress in this moment, okay? She's pissed one second, she's being Clytemnestra. We know that she's probably excited that Agamemnon's coming home because she's got a great plan for what's gonna happen when he returns home. But now she turns to the Herald and she plays doting wife. Shock to us all. And she does it very convincingly because she turns to the Herald and she says, do tell my husband that I have remained incredibly loyal to him this whole time. I have been unwavering in my loyalty and I am so proud of my nobility and my connection to such a great man that I would shout it from the rooftops of my CD. I would tell everyone because no distance can come between us. Nothing can come between our love and our bond. She literally says in line 603 in the Fagel's translation, I'm stressing that because last time you guys were like, what translation? In this one in particular, it's at line 603. She says that she has been faithful to the last. And she tells the Herald at the end of this that he should go back and tell Agamemnon the good news that, you know, all of them are waiting for him and for him to hurry back to his people and to hurry back to his wife. At the end of this speech, she turns around, she walks back into the palace, being the lovely, floating, faithful wife that she is publicizing that she is, because she's absolutely not, bear in mind. <laughs> and the people knew this, the people watching this knew this, and everybody's like, oh goodness, she is really committing to this role of like 1950s housewife. Obviously they weren't saying that in ancient times, but we're probably thinking this nowadays. When you read this, you're just like, oh. But she can only do it for these short amount of times. So when she comes on stage, she says her thing and then she leaves. And that's something that I love. Obviously, again, this is because there were only a certain amount of actors that could be on stage because you had to switch and all of this sort of stuff. Again, you could only employ so many actors in ancient times. But if you look at it from, you know, the, just the perspective of the audience, you have Clytemnestra who comes on for these little bouts of like, I'm going to be the perfect wife or I'm going to express excitement that my husband is coming home because I'm totally not going to kill him. And then she just can't continue it any longer. And so then she just goes back into the palace. That's how I read it. Anywho, once Clytemnestra is gone though, we then have the chorus leader grab onto the herald as the herald tries to leave the stage. And actually he asks the herald, okay, it's great that Agamemnon is behind you, but what happened to his brother Menelaus? Is Menelaus home? Did he make it back with Helen? Is he safe? You know, what's the deal there? And the herald turns around and says to the chorus leader, funny you should ask, Menelaus is lost at sea. It's really awkward. We hope he's okay. We know he's with a whole boat full of people, but like, he's not home yet. And then he turns around and he leaves. Now, the reason why I wanted to include that, because I know a lot of people will cut out that part when they're just going through, you know, the action of the play and what goes on in the play. The reason why I'm highlighting that is because if you want to know what happened to Menelaus, you can check out book four of Homer's Odyssey, because that tells you that Menelaus took seven years to get home and he had a f***ing wild ride. Okay, this man dressed up as a seal at one point. He trapped a sea deity at one point. He's on the coast of Egypt. Like he had his own epic essentially. <laughs> and the fact that it is just reduced to a chapter in the Odyssey, I don't think gives enough credit. So I want you guys to know that if you guys want to know what happened to Menelaus, and you guys want to know how long it took him to get home, you can read that in book four of the Odyssey because it is insane. Anywho, back to the play. Once the Herald leaves the stage, the chorus pick up into another choral ode and they sing a fate of destiny, of all of this like serious, you know, trope shit that happens in Greek mythology. But they do it in like a really metaphorical way. That's why I'm not breaking down the choral odes 
for you and analyzing them because you just need to know that they are singing as the scene is changing and as people are coming onto the stage because as they are singing, who comes home but Agamemnon. Agamemnon appears on stage in a chariot and next to him standing in the chariot is Cassandra, who is a princess of Troy, was a princess of Troy. She's the daughter of Priam, was a daughter of Priam. He's dead now. Anyways, so she is now his prisoner of war and she is in the chariot with him. Okay, so they both appear on stage and as they appear on stage, the chorus are still in their choral ode but they switch it to suddenly bring attention to Agamemnon and they say how they know that he is their king even though they haven't seen him in 10 years. It must be him. He's this amazing man. They remember the last time that they saw him, the last time that he left Mycenae. He had this look of menace. They knew that he was gonna go and do the deed and he was going to immediately you know, kill all the Trojans and do what was right and bring Helen home. So they are just gassing him up basically towards the end of their choral ode. The last part of their choral ode though is not gassing Agamemnon up and is actually telling Agamemnon that now is his time as the king of Mycenae to come and inspect his city, to come and inspect his kingdom and to see who has remained loyal and who has not. We know who has not. That's what the play is about. It's about to get real. In response to the chorus, Agamemnon now speaks for the first time, not only in his kingdom, but also in the play. So Agamemnon not getting out of the chariot. That's important that you guys know. He's still standing in the chariot, but he looks out to the chorus and he says that since he's come home successful, since they have come home alive, since there seems to be sort of no, you know, bump in the road, that now is the chorus's time, the people of Argos' time, that's important. It's the people of the Argolids' time, the people of Mycenae's time to now raise up prayers and to give sacrifices to the gods to thank them for his victory because he would be nothing without the gods. As he's stressing all of this though, Clytemnestra comes back out of the palace. She comes with her ladies in waiting and all of her ladies in waiting, that they're not called ladies in waiting, I just wanna stress that, but she does come up with a bunch of ladies, right? They're all behind her. All of them are holding these huge tapestries, okay? They're huge, really richly colored, deeply colored tapestries. And they start laying out the tapestries between the palace door, which is at the back of the stage, and the chariot that Agamemnon is in. So as he's speaking, this is happening on stage and Clytemnestra is walking over to where Agamemnon stands with Cassandra as they are both in the chariot. When Agamemnon wraps up talking like this and wraps up talking about how great the gods are and how he would be nothing without them, how sacrifices need to be made to them, Clytemnestra walks over to her husband and she speaks to him. This is the first time that this married couple have spoken in 10 years. I do want to stress that because the conversation is unbelievably childish. <laughs> Just point blank as you read it. It's like one line, one line, one line, one line, and they are bickering like children or like a couple who's been married for 50 years that hate each other, which is much more reliable to what they are. It is very obvious that they don't like each other, even though Clytemnestra is playing doting wife in this moment. Clytemnestra opens by actually giving us an Oscar winning speech, in my opinion, okay? This bitch clearly hates her husband, and yet she opens the conversation by saying how much she loves him. Okay, she opens it by being like, oh, I've missed you so much and I love you so much. And let me tell you how terrible it was for me when you were away. She explains that the initial leaving of a husband is horrible for any woman, right? Because that is, you know, super lonely and all of this sort of jazz, but it gets worse when the husband is away for a long period of time and rumors of what's happening to the husband and what's happening in war get back to the wife. Okay, she describes this as literally being like a sickness that was breaking out over her, that her, her forehead was sweating and you know, it was just terrible. And she was like, oh, woe is me. I don't know if my husband is okay or not. And these rumors are horrible and I hope he's okay because it hurts me to not know what's happening to him. She describes this period as basically living between death and life, right? So there's like this awful sort of like middle ground where when a wife is waiting for her husband, that's what it feels like. That's why it's like this eternal sickness that she was in. And she's literally giving us the most, you guys. She goes on this whole spiel about how amazing Agamemnon is, about stressing his legacy, stressing their family, stressing their children, stressing all of this stuff that as a mother, as a woman, as a doting wife, she has had to deal with alone, but he is amazing and he is home and she's so excited. She reaches out his hand for him and she's like, come down off the chariot, walk with me into our home. She's chatting absolute baloney, just so that you guys know. She doesn't believe a word of this, 
okay? We will find out in a hot second that she doesn't believe a word of this. And Agamemnon is not too wild about his wife saying this, okay? And this is where the argument starts because she has all the tapestries laid out. And so when she reaches out her hand and she's like, hey, step down to the tapestries, walk her inside with me, right? Let's go into the palace. Let's be husband and wife again. Agamemnon's like, mm, I don't really like the look of those tapestries though. It's not really, not really what I wanna do. The language he uses, the vocabulary he uses is quite cold towards his wife. I don't want him to be let off the hook because he does respond in quite an abrasive way. But the general gist of this argument, and it goes on for lines, for pages it goes on, and it's Agamemnon saying on one side of it, I'm not comfortable stepping on the tapestries because, I'm just summarizing this for you by the way, but because he doesn't want to step on the tapestries since they are very, very nice, they are very, very expensive, him not stepping on the ground and instead stepping on this incredibly luxurious collection of items is gonna come across that he views himself as higher than a king and more so on par with the gods and that he's getting special treatment and he's like, the gods are currently looking because we're making all these sacrifices to them. I've just done the war, they're on my side. I don't wanna do anything to piss them off. And we need to bear in mind that Agamemnon has a history of pissing off gods, okay? So when he sees this, he's like, no, this is a recipe for disaster. And as he says this, cause he basically repeats that over and over and over again, Clytemnestra, doesn't really like this because Clytemnestra needs him to step on these tapestries. She has a whole argument where she's saying, oh, well, I don't want the dirt from Troy to go on the dirt of our home. That way we can collect it in the tapestries and then we can shake it off somewhere else. And you know, it's it's gonna be much better this way because we don't want the contamination of Troy and, and the terrible luck and the awful deaths and all of that to come into Mycenae. Agamemnon doesn't buy it. She then says something along the lines of like, I did this really nice thing for you. Why won't you just step on the tapestries? And Agamemnon explains, Again, this is why I don't want to. So bear in mind this whole time they're arguing, he's still in the chariot. Okay, he has not stepped outside of the chariot and Clytemnestra is there just trying to get him to step off the fucking chariot and onto the tapestries to get inside. Now you might be wondering, why is Clytemnestra stressing the tapestries? This is an analysis point. Okay, I wanna make that very clear now. If you want to understand the meaning of the tapestries, the imagery, the theatrical imagery that's going on here, you have to get into the analysis, but just know that she is gunning for him to, to make this one step. And so what she does is at the end, she basically says, look, you're the king. Why do you care what anybody else thinks of you? If they think that you're acting like a god, uh, why can't you just accept this nice thing that your wife is doing for you? I laid this all out. You should just do it regardless of what anybody else thinks. And I think that would be a really nice thing for you to do. And Agamemnon, in response to this, says that she is being very manly and very forceful, actually. He's like, where is the woman in all of this lust for glory that you're talking about? But fine, in order to stop this argument, in order to just get this out of the way, I will step onto the stupid tapestries. And so he does, he takes a step down and he actually hesitates. He takes that one step and he hesitates and Clytemnestra has to bully him a little bit more <laughs> to getting him to do it. And so eventually he does and he walks along the tapestries and into the palace, but he leaves Cassandra in the chariot. Okay, so now Agamemnon is inside with Clytemnestra. All the ladies are now cleaning up the tapestries and they bring all the tapestry back inside, which means that we are left with the chorus and Cassandra still on stage. The chorus start by actually saying that only now that they've seen Agamemnon do they believe all the news that the Trojan War has now ended and they believe Clytemnestra. And as they are singing and they're saying all this stuff like, yeah, you know, we believe him. They do start getting this really dark undertone saying that something is wrong, right? And they say that when a man dies, when a, his blood is spilt, you cannot come back from that. that. That's sort of like a final act, right? And so they start sort of telling us that now the tables have turned. Now that Agamemnon is inside, it's about to go down. So without spoiling the play, which I already did, but without spoiling the play, they're now telling us, okay, something bad is about to happen. And as they're singing this choral ode, Clytemnestra comes back out from the palace. Clytemnestra is like, hold on, Agamemnon came in. There was definitely somebody else in the chariot. So who is that? And she comes out to Cassandra and she basically says, hey, I'm now your queen. And I told you and my husband to get into the palace and you haven't moved. So let's go. And Cassandra acts as if like she can't hear Clytemnestra. Like literally she's just out of it. Like she is not listening. She gives no indication she can even understand the Greek that Clytemnestra is speaking. So Clytemnestra just kind of stands there and is like, hello, 
I'm talking to you. Hello, what's your name? Cassandra. Hi, really nice to meet you. I'm now your queen. You should probably get used to taking orders from me because you're now a slave. Hello, welcome to your new life. And still Cassandra does not reply, right? So Clytemnestra continues. Cassandra doesn't reply, and the chorus even, seeing Clytemnestra struggle, try to get involved, and <laughs> they are just kind of basically in the background going, that's the queen, you should probably follow orders. Cassandra's not reacting whatsoever. She has not stepped out of the chariot yet. She's literally not moved positions. So Clytemnestra gets really frustrated and goes back inside. And as she's walking back inside, she basically just says, you know, make sure she gets out of the, the chariot because she has to get used to her new role in this house. And she goes inside. And once Clytemnestra has gone inside, because she has been quite forceful towards Cassandra, the chorus decide that they are going to take a different approach to Cassandra. And instead what they are going to do is they are going to just try and sort of egg her out of this thing, right? They're just going to try and encourage her to get out. So, you know, they kind of start saying, you know, welcome, this is now your new home. Would you like to step down and go into the palace? The queen seems pretty mad at you. And Cassandra speaks for the first time. And instead of replying to anybody, and instead of replying to moving, she just yells, Apollo! Which obviously, uh, the chorus hear this, and the chorus are like, what? So Cassandra, instead of replying to them, again screams about Apollo. And the chorus say, after this happened like three times, the chorus say one of my favorite things in response, which is genuinely comical. And they're like, this has got to be a bad omen for something, right? Like she just keeps yelling about Apollo. Apollo's not here. What the f is going on? Now, finally, on the fourth try, Cassandra does step out of the chariot and she looks up to the palace behind her and she yells for Apollo and she says, where have you led me to now? And luckily the chorus are there because the chorus are like, oh my God, we're so glad you asked. <laughs> You're actually at the house of Atreus. With Cassandra then turns around, she sort of snaps into the scene and she's like, the what? And the chorus are like, the house of Atreus. This is your new home. Welcome. And Cassandra replies saying, that's the house of Atreus. I am not going in there. You are out of your minds. Obviously the chorus are like, what are you talking about? How could you possibly mean that you're not going in there? This is your new home. And Cassandra explains that this is a cursed house. And what Cassandra's speech after this, this whole Cassandra scene, just so that you guys know, is her explaining the past, the present, and the future. So she does three different things. So the first thing, now that she's been prompted by the chorus, is to explain the past, to explain how this house is cursed. So first things first, she goes into the background of Thyestes and Atreus. Now I want to let you guys know that the curse on the house of Atreus did technically start with the generation before these two brothers, but this is just what the play tells you, so this is what I'm going to tell you. That actually Atreus, who is Agamemnon's father, and Thyestes, who is Atreus' brother, and also then Aegisthus' father, that's relevant for later. Atreus, very long story short, he found out that Thyestes has slept with his wife, drama. And when he found this out, he basically got Thyestes out of exile because he had previously exiled him, invited him back in for dinner. And when he invited him for dinner, Atreus killed, <laughs> this is so dark, I should have put a trigger warning, but oh well. He killed Thyestes' son and fed Thyestes' son on a silver platter. And during the meal, when Thyestes sort of clocks this, he's already eaten a lot of the meal, he reels back, he starts vomiting and all this sort of stuff. And that is that act, right? So the adultery that Thyestes uh, committed, but also then the killing of the child and feeding it to Thyestes is what has caused the house to be cursed. Now, obviously when Cassandra is explaining this, the chorus hear this and they say, how could you possibly know this? Like you're acting as if and you're speaking as if you were there that day when this happened and this is true because Cassandra at one point does say, did I stutter? Basically, I obviously paraphrase. So when the chorus say, how could you possibly know this? Cassandra explains the present and the present moment, she explains what happened between her and Apollo. And that's, you know, what she was saying earlier when she was like, Apollo, Apollo. She's like, remember how I was doing that? Well, that's what happened to me a hot second ago because what happened, and this is the story that we get in Aeschylus, which is gonna be different to what a lot of you guys have heard online. This story does change throughout mythology, but the one that we get in Aeschylus is that Cassandra says that Apollo gifted her the gift of prophecy and when they were going to do the deed, because she had agreed to have some sexy time with Apollo, at the very last second, she decided to say no, and she didn't want to do it. Now, Apollo does not force himself on her. Apollo does not yell at her. Apollo doesn't react, pretty much. He hears no, he gets up, and he walks away from her. So she thinks she's already got the gift of prophecy, and the god just walked away from her. So that's a, that's a win, actually, with regards to the Greek gods. And she only realized that she had a curse 
when she then walked out of that room, went to her family when Troy is still, you know, standing. She goes to them and she says, I have the gift of prophecy and I now know that our city is going to fall. And all the women literally call her crazy and laugh at her. And that is the moment that Cassandra realized that she was cursed. So she tells us this now and the chorus hearing this are like, oh my God, that really sucks. But given how you describe the past, we believe your present. And now Cassandra launches into the future and she starts saying, Agamemnon, your king is going to die. Agamemnon is going to die and this horrible thing is going to happen. It's about to happen. When I go in there, this is a cursed house. This is the act that is coming in the future. And obviously the chorus are not happy to hear this, but because they've heard Cassandra speak as much as they have, they're like, well, if you know the future, then who is it? Which man could plot such a horrible thing for their king? How could this happen? And Cassandra interrupts them and says, you haven't been listening to a word I've been saying because your king is going to die, but she is going to kill him and she is going to kill me. And the chorus are obviously like, huh? Not that Cassandra takes really any notice of them. Part of her character is that she's also kind of in her own world the whole time. And so she actually starts telling the audience and telling the chorus how she kind of has to accept that now it's gonna be her death as well, right? This is the end of the road for her. When she goes inside, she's going to be killed by this woman. They haven't named her, but they say by this woman, she's gonna be killed. And so now that she's accepted it, what she wishes, the only thing she wants from this whole encounter is that her death is quick, painless, and happens in a single blow. Okay, that's it, that's all she wants. And so very, very bravely, Cassandra walks up to the palace door and she puts her hand on the handle to go inside and pauses and then recoils. And when she recoils, the chorus are like, okay, you just had this whole speech about how you totally accepted your death, how you were ready to walk into it. This was your like one but sort of like, you know, little asterisk on the side of death. Why have you stopped now? You're like <laughs> kind of going against what you just told all of us. And Cassandra starts speaking and she says, in my opinion, one of the most horrible things to have ever been written in Greek tragedy, which I thankfully wrote down. And the first quote that she says is, this house breeds with murder. And the reason why she pulls back from the handle and she recoils is because she says, I know the odor and I can smell an open grave, which should give you fucking chills. She is literally saying, I'm about to go in there, lose my life, lose everything. This is horrible. And the chorus are trying their best to be encouraging, but like, how can you be encouraging in this instance? And they're kind of like, it's okay. <laughs> I swear it's gonna be quick, it'll be fine. And not really listening to them, Cassandra just kind of bites the bullet and she goes into the palace. And this is when the chorus erupt into their very, very famous uh, song, where they start, you know, just sort of talking about the horrors. They start talking about fate and destiny again. And unfortunately, <laughs> when you're reading this as like a, what happens in the play? This is very much a panto moment because as they're singing this horrible thing, we then hear from inside the palace, a scream, right? So there's like an, ah! And the chorus are like, oh my goodness, wait, a scream has come from inside the palace. And so then we listen again and Agamemnon, we hear his voice. He goes, I've been stabbed. I get this is a tragedy. Obviously, I know people are gonna be in the comments like, Erica, take this seriously. It is quite funny though, that he's being stabbed and he has enough time to tell us that he's being stabbed. And not just once, he actually does it twice because the chorus leader is like, wait, we should listen. He said he's being stabbed. And then Agamemnon goes, ah, I've been stabbed a second time. And the chorus are like, oh my God. And the chorus do start panicking. They do do a very, you know, tragic thing. They start panicking. And so they're like, let's scatter and try and get out of here. And as all of them are scattering, one of the members of the chorus goes over to the door of the palace and opens the door to reveal the horrible scene that has happened from within the house. And what's happened, what we are now faced with is the dead body of Agamemnon, who is covered in bloody sheets. And next to him is Cassandra, who's also covered in her own blood. And that's not all guys, because standing next to them is Clytemnestra holding the bloody murder weapon. This is officially in her villain era. I am so excited because suddenly we have just lost this facade that she's had the whole play. She's holding the weapon and she looks out at the chorus and basically shrugs and goes, and what? The chorus are shook. Okay, the chorus are shook to the point where they stop scattering. They stare at Clytemnestra and they're like, now is your time to tell us 
what the fuck has happened? Did you seriously just kill your husband who is also our king and his concubine? Like what, what happened inside there that all of a sudden this changed from you being incredibly loving to then being a literal murderer? So Clytemnestra explains to us that actually she's been planning this for years and she feels much better now that it's out of her system because it's been sitting in her brain for this very long period of time. Now she finally got to act it out and all of the pain that she has been harboring for the last 10 years is now out in the open and she has done the only thing that she has wanted to do. She even tells us how she killed Agamemnon. So she stabbed him in the tub, right? So this is something that we know. She stabbed him in the tub and she says she had to stab him three times, okay? The first time was to get him on the ground and then because he didn't get on the ground, she had to stab him a second time to make sure that he was basically stunned, right? And he wasn't gonna move because he's a big guy. Remember this, he's a big guy, he's a big soldier. So he's now on the ground and the third time was to kill him. And it just occurred to me, I'm telling you, all of these gory details, YouTube is gonna censor the fuck out of this video, but I hope you're enjoying it because it means I'm not gonna make any money from this, but regardless. <laughs> Clytemnestra ends this though by saying a very powerful line and she spits to the chorus, my lord, is home at last. And I just read that from the actual book. So that is an actual quote from line 14, 14, 14, 23 is the line. Okay, I just had to do that quick maths, but that is what she says at the end of it. And obviously the chorus are shook. Okay, the chorus again, they are very, very shocked that she could say this. There's no remorse, you know, as they can see, she has absolutely no remorse for it. And they basically just say, well, now look at what you've done. And because of what you've done, there is going to be vengeance that is sought for this horrible act. And you're going to lose your loved ones in the process. Clytemnestra does not agree with this, right? Because she just looks at the chorus leader and she's like, what are you talking about? This is a masterpiece. Look at what I've done. This is a masterpiece of justice. And she reprimands the chorus for trying to exile Clytemnestra because they say, you know, with all this vengeance and all of this, you are going to be cast out. You're going to be exiled for this horrible act of killing your husband. And Clytemnestra says, you can't exile me because when Agamemnon killed our daughter, you didn't want to exile him. That was fine. We can kill my child, no problem. But when I take vengeance on the man that killed my child, suddenly I'm going to exile. That's not what's happening here. Clytemnestra says that she is happy with the death of Agamemnon. And when the chorus try to rebuttal her again, she comes up with a new argument, which is actually that it's not entirely her fault that she killed Agamemnon. Here's a new one. She says, it's not really my fault because there is this curse in the household, which is now in me and it's in my family because I married into this household. So this whole murder vengeance thing, you know, like what could I do? Which obviously the chorus reply and they're like, hold on, are you claiming innocence to picking up a weapon and killing your husband? Like, I'm just curious as to where you're going with this. And Clytemnestra says, no, I mean, I definitely did it. And again, she's not unhappy that she did it. She feels a massive sense of relief. She owns up to it on the spot. She's like, yeah, no, this is, this is life now. And she ends her speech by basically saying that now her and Aegisthus, who is the guy that she has shacked up with, who is Agamemnon's cousin, because he's Thyestes' son, she says, now me and Aegisthus can rule over the Mycenaeans. We can rule over this kingdom together because Aegisthus has always been loyal to me, unlike Agamemnon, who is a piece of garbage on the ground. So now I'm very happy and I get to live with Aegisthus and speak of the devil, Aegisthus now walks into the scene. He brings a posse of his bodyguards and he shows up, he sort of saunters in and he's like, hey. Now nobody asks Aegisthus to do this, but he starts to tell us why he hates Agamemnon. So he explains the whole, as I told you guys, the whole Thyestes versus Atreus issue. But when he explains this again, he says, he really says it from like a son's point of view, where he says, the reason why I hate Agamemnon is because me and my father were forced into exile. Me and my father were brought back. My brother was killed. And I've wanted to avenge uh, this whole issue. You know, I've wanted to kill Agamemnon because I obviously can't kill Atreus because he's dead, but I've wanted to do it on behalf of my father and on the struggles that we faced as a family because of him. Now, obviously in reaction to this, the chorus are like, oh, so, so you as a man coming back and avenging your father on behalf of this horrible thing that happened with your uncle and the king's father. Uh, so, so you're the one that killed 
all these people, right? So you killed Agamemnon and you killed Cassandra if you're really mad about this. Which I think is a valid point because that's essentially what Aegisthus came in to say, that he's like, I had all this vengeance built up in me, blah, blah, blah. And then he doesn't claim that he killed anybody, but the chorus are trying to figure out why the fuck he showed up on stage, right? They're just like, why are you here anyways? <laughs> like you had nothing to do with this seemingly. And Aegisthus then says to the chorus, oh no, I didn't kill them. That was, that was not me. That's clearly woman's work. That's literally what he says. He's like, this is clearly woman's work. I didn't deliver the, the kill blow. Don't worry, guys, that wasn't actually me. And this totally backfires on him because then the chorus look at him and they go, hold on, so you're the man between you and Clytemnestra. You're the physical man. And yet you were too much of a baby. You were too much of a baby to actually kill the man that you wanted to avenge. So you let your wife do it. And you let your wife take the blow. Dude, that doesn't look so good for you. It's totally hilarious that it managed to backfire on Aegisthus in this way. And Aegisthus gets so bothered by this that he then orders his bodyguards to attack the chorus. Bear in mind the chorus are elderly men. So you're like, Aegisthus, what are you trying to prove in this moment? But anywho, the men then try to attack Aegisthus and Clytemnestra sees this and she steps in between them. And very long story short, she basically says, there will be no more bloodshed in Mycenae. I am now the queen, I am now ruler, I have sacrificed the man that did me wrong. I have killed the guy who killed my daughter, an act for an act, wound for a wound, body for body, death for death. Okay, we are now even, that is enough. And she tells all of them to back away from one another, and the chorus do, but adjust this because he seemingly is a man child. <laughs> he actually says to the chorus, you guys are dogs and you should treat your master, who's me since I'm the king, better than you already do because I'm about to go into that palace and rule over you with all of the money that Agamemnon has brought back, all of his riches, and I'm going to civilize his people as your king. So watch out. Pretty brave Aegisthus, but okay. And Clytemnestra basically starts to pull Aegisthus back into the palace towards the end of the play, and the chorus call after them to say, Orestes, who is Agamemnon's son, will come back and will avenge his father and this horrible, horrible heinous act that has happened here at Mycenae. And as they are walking into the palace, Clytemnestra tells Aegisthus not to react, and she says, now we are rulers, now we will rule over these people. And that's the end of the play. That's the end! This was a super long episode. Super long. It is just a summary of one goddamn play. You guys could have watched that play in that time. <laughs> I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you guys enjoyed hearing about Agamemnon and how he comes to his horrible end, how he comes to his death. Um, I hope that that was everything you hoped that it would be. But um, yeah, the next play, which we'll be diving into, is The Libation Bearers. And the Libation Bearers follows Orestes, who does in fact come back and he will get his vengeance on behalf of his father. So that's what we're gonna be uploading next. I'm very excited to give you the rest of this series. Thank you guys so much for watching, and we'll be seeing you next time with more videos here on Monink. So I'll see you guys then.